Okay, welcome everyone. Good to see you guys. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here today uh, with our distinguished panelists. Uh, my name is Nahal Tusi. I'm a reporter with Politico. And today our focus is Iran. We have with us Michael Singh, a top scholar at the Washington Institute for Nearest Policy and uh, also a former George W. Bush administration official focused on the Middle East. Elliot Abrams, who pretty much needs no introduction. Right. Um, but he is different than Elliot Cohen. I'm told there's like a bow tie and tie difference. Um, and Dennis Ross, legendary person who has been trying to bring peace to the Middle East and still has time. Yeah. So <laughs> um, as I said, our focus is Iran, and I'm really confident that our audience is sophisticated on this topic. So I'll be asking some fairly wide ranging questions. One inspiration for today's gathering is the book Handoff. This book's lead editor was Stephen Hadley, and it describes the Bush administration's foreign policy through the transition memos that it left for the Obama administration. One of our panelists, Michael, uh, put together a chapter for that book about the Iran policy. I highly recommend it, though maybe with a strong beverage. So, <laughs> Mike, let's start That's with you. all Middle East conversations, actually. <laughs> um, so look, it, it's tough to quickly summarize any administration's Iran policy, but I think it's safe to say that one key difference between the Bush and Barack Obama approaches to Iran was that the Obama team was more willing to negotiate without preconditions and to decouple the nuclear issue from Iran's regional behavior or misbehavior. But both used sanctions and ultimately Obama got a nuclear deal with Iran. Um, you were a member of the Bush administration. Knowing everything you know now, if you could change one thing about your Iran policy then, what would it be? Sure. And uh, thanks, um, everyone, for, for being here at the Washington Institute, where I'm managing director. Um, look, as I, as I put together this Iran chapter about the Bush administration's Iran policy and how it looks in retrospect, it was a pretty complicated task because you know, to sum up Iran policy is difficult. And, and in fact, with the Bush administration, I would say that there were um, at least sort of two distinct periods of Iran policy. There was sort of the first uh, term of the Bush administration where, you know, frankly, coming in in 2001, I think the focus was much more on Iran's sponsorship of terrorism, less on the nuclear issue. And there was actually a lot of U.S.-Iran engagement on matters like Afghanistan or, um, or, or other issues. And, and some of that engagement um, was actually relatively positive, uh, as in, say, the case of Afghanistan. Uh, and some of it ultimately went nowhere. And of course, all of it ultimately went nowhere because uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Iran was uh, quite adversarial both then and now. Um, then there was sort of the second term where the nuclear issue really came to the fore and took over and you could argue sort of sucked all the oxygen out of the room. If I, I think that, you know, as, as you look back, though, there are two things which are really striking um, about the Bush administration's Iran policy that you would want to do differently in sort of retrospect. One is, I'm not sure we were focused enough on Iran during the first term of the Bush administration. You mean like at all? At all. And, you know, there was a lot going on, obviously, in U.S. foreign policy that time. We had 9-11. We had the uh, U.S. military action in Afghanistan. Then we had the invasion of Iraq in 2003. <clears throat> and in the midst of all that, in 2002, you have these dramatic revelations about Iran's nuclear activities, uh, nuclear activities, which were actually quite advanced. And there was no question about them. This wasn't, you know, an intelligence question. They were they were there and it was acknowledged by the international community, uh, you know, quite stark contrast to Iraq. But the focus in the United States was not on that. It was on Iraq. And so there was a decision, I think, um, from what I understand, I wasn't in the White House at the time to essentially leave that issue to the Europeans at the time, because they had an ongoing process of negotiation with the Iranians and the U.S. was was quite preoccupied with other issues. I think an earlier focus on Iran, which, you know, had demonstrated its danger to the United States through its sponsorship of terrorism, now is openly seeking, you know, we can argue whether it was nuclear weapons or not, but certainly there was plenty of evidence to suggest that was the purpose and that is the purpose of the program. I think that would have been good. The second thing, of course, um, and I think that it's important to be quite frank about this, is the way that the sort of fall of the regime in Iraq uh, as a result of the U.S. invasion ended up giving Iran an advantage in the region. Now, I, the debate about sort of the Iraq war is a debate which is ongoing. Obviously, there's a separate chapter in the book, and I wasn't involved in Iraq policy. A different panel. <laughs> a different panel, indeed. <laughs> But I think there's no no real debate that the fall of the regime in Iraq 
strengthen Iran uh, and open the door really for Iranian meddling, not just in Iraq, but potentially beyond. And again, I'm not sure that was sufficiently foreseen uh, by uh, folks who are working on uh, policy during the Bush administration. And so I think if we were to start with sort of a self-critique, actually it wouldn't have much to do with direct engagement of the Iranians. There was actually, contrary to sort of conventional wisdom, actually a lot of U.S.-Iran engagement during the George W. Bush administration. Um, I think it was more about that those kind of early years and did we focus enough on this issue when it was still a relatively small issue? Uh, and then again, the interplay between the Iraq and Iran issues. Really, mm -hmm. really good points. Um, Elliot, um, President Trump abandoned the Iran nuclear deal in 2018 and relied on a maximum pressure campaign largely driven by sanctions um, to bring Iran, I guess, to the table or to make some sort of change there. It did not stop Iran's nuclear program or its dangerous activities in the region. I still don't know how to label the Biden team's Iran strategy. Um, I mean, I literally like a few weeks ago, I hear the deal is dead forever. <laughs> now I'm hearing rumors like, oh, there might be progress. I just whatever. Um, they haven't dropped the sanctions, though. And although there are arguments over how well the Biden administration is enforcing the sanctions, um, they've also heaped on new sanctions, uh, in part because of the protests and how the regime has cracked down there. And they've tried diplomacy. Um, but again, Iran's behavior hasn't changed. So what is the United States not trying that it needs to be trying? <clears throat> uh, well, one answer to that is uh, a maximum pressure campaign. Wait, we already tried and that. No, I, I think that's not right. Oh, so so the, administration, wanna... the Trump administration did not do a maximum no, pressure? first, the Trump administration did that for two years. There was no maximum pressure campaign in the first half of the administration, the maximum pressure campaign revs up really 2019 and 20. The idea was, and the idea may have been completely wrong, we will never know. Um, the idea was that if Trump were reelected, it would be possible to say to Iran, okay, you ain't seen nothing yet. We have reduced your uh, reserves to $4 billion. They were running out of money. We will pile on more sanctions and we have four years to do it in and it will do enormous damage to Iran or let's negotiate. Let's have a serious and broad negotiation, not just the nuclear issue, but uh, all regional issues as well. Would that have worked? A lot of people tell you obviously not. I don't think it's obvious that it would not. I think we will never know unless someday, you know, the Iranian archives are, opened and tell us things. So what, what should we be doing now? What is the policy now? The policy obviously uh, was to go back to the JCPOA. No surprise, um, the president, secretary of state, national security advisor, others were involved in the JCPOA. Um, they wanted to go back to it. Uh, I was not a fan of the JCPOA, but that was certainly a reasonable policy for them to pursue. But you know, we're now, <laughs> getting into the pre-election period, I and mean, we're well into the second half of the administration. And despite all those rumors, which we all see, there's no progress. Um, so what is the policy? If it isn't going back to the JCPOA, uh, I, I'd answer in one word, drift. Uh, I don't think there is a policy, except for one thing. The president has said, they're not gonna get a nuclear weapon on my watch. Now that's a really fraught statement. That means that um, if it were to happen that the CIA came to the president and said, we have uh, high confidence having reviewed new information that they've made the decision to go for it and to go for it now, um, this year, say 2024, the president, you know, by his words would need to do something about that. But today I don't see any policy. I just see them, drifting in some kind of hope that maybe, maybe the JCPOA will come back. But to be clear, the, the Biden administration hasn't lifted the sanctions that the Trump administration imposed on Iran. So I'm guessing you're thinking they also haven't enforced them enough. Is well, I think fair? on the question of, of uh, for example, oil sales to China, there those clearly, you can chart them, those clearly have risen in the last couple of years. <clears throat> I think the other thing that they haven't done is convince the Iranians that there is a believable American military deterrent. Um, 
whatever the president is thinking, the Iranians don't seem to believe that there is a real chance that the president would act uh, at some point as they approach having a nuclear weapon. Now, the administration, to be fair, has certainly not done zero. Um, it has done things like exercises um, whose clear intent is you know, to show that we're thinking about Iran, but there are other things that it has not done. I would certainly say it has not done all that it could reasonably do to convince the Iranians, you're never going to get there while I'm president. A quick, quick, quick yes or no follow up. If the Iranians were to come to believe that Trump might come back into power, <laughs> would they be more likely or less likely to come back and negotiate a deal or, or stop their nuclear activities? Uh, really hard question. I assume they would find him, it's not a yes or no question. They would find him unpredictable, which he is and was um, more like. I would say more likely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, it was a more likely or a less likely question. <laughs> okay. that, I, guess. I mean, at the, at the risk at the risk of butting in very oh. briefly. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I do think the one worry you have to have right now is that if what Elliot is saying is true about how the Iranians, how much stock they put in U.S. military warnings now, and there is a possibility that you get, say, you know, a, a, a more sort of uh, determined president in the next term, whether that's President Trump or someone else who's just more has more military credibility, let's say that that means this is a window of opportunity for the Iranians to move forward. Um, that That is my real worry right now. Yeah, I, can I butt in before? Um, can I, why don't I ask the question? You can combine. I'll absolutely do that. It's, okay. <laughs> so there have been some significant regional shifts in the Middle East, from the Abraham Accords to the restoration of Saudi-Iran ties, brokered by China, to a slow reintegration of Syria into the fold. And we have some analysts now arguing that a new nuclear deal with Iran should be brokered by its neighbors. Do you think that idea has much heft and should or can Israel be part of the process? So, look, I, I think the the idea that the regional parties should be part of the process is something that regional parties themselves were saying. One of the big complaints they had about the JCPOA is this was an issue that affected them very directly, and yet they weren't a part of it. Now, the question is, if they were a part of it, would it have changed things in any, any material way? It probably would have changed, I think, some of our negotiating positions because I don't think we were taking their needs or concerns particularly into account. Would it affect the Iranian calculus? I don't think so. I don't see a whole lot of evidence that the Iranians are looking at anybody in the region other than the Israelis uh, and have any sense of, of fear of them. When it suits them to have to improve relations, they'll choose to improve relations. When it suits them to change, because they, they believe they have the right to dominate the region. Uh, when it suits them to move in a in a more coercive fashion towards them, they'll do that as well. What's interesting right now, by the way, uh, is that the restoration of relations between the Saudis and the Iranians was built in part on a Saudi condition that you really have to control the Houthis, you have to limit what goes there, we have to have a ceasefire that endures and so forth. Now, the ceasefire has been enduring, but so have the weapons to the Houthis from the Iranians. So they're building up the Houthi capability. You know, you have a long-term ceasefire. One of the virtues of it is on the part of the Houthis, they can rebuild themselves. They had lost quite a bit. So here are the Iranians contributing to that. Now, for the time being, there's a relative calm. So that suits the Saudi interest. And maybe it suits the Iranian interest as well. But they're also putting themselves in a position where they can also change that reality. Uh, the, the point I was going to make a little earlier is there, there is another factor here in this whole equation uh, the more, if we have a policy of drift, as Elliot was suggesting, it is a drift in which the Iranians draw closer and closer to having the ability to become a nuclear weapon state. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, they are hardening all of their nuclear infrastructure. Now, the significance of that is if you're sitting in Israel and you take a look at this, you say they're building up the wherewithal and they're making it harder for us to attack that infrastructure. And at a certain point, the combination of the two means we lose the option. Ehud Barak years ago used to talk about this as a zone of immunity. I don't think any Israeli government, including the one led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, is going to put themselves in a position where they lose the option. And I think they'll convey that to the United States. Now, that, that may well have an impact on what the Biden administration does or what a successor uh, might do as well. So the Iranians have a window of opportunity and the Israelis have a window of opportunity. <laughs>
So you know, what, the, but that should right. make us that should that's quite a fraught situation. Mm. Because at first it leads to great potential for misreading. Uh, and second, you know, in a in a situation where you have a balance of terror uh, and there's no nothing to be gained by striking first, no one strikes first. In a situation where you don't have that and you see high risks and not acting, the potential to act goes up dramatically. You know, just just one thing on this issue, and you had actually asked me about it, I think, Kelly, in the first question mm -hmm. about the connection between the nuclear issue and the regional issue. Because I think this was actually a significant difference between the Bush approach and the Obama approach. And I also don't know where it stands today. Um, you know, the, the view in the Bush administration had always been that a, a sustainable nuclear arrangement would only actually follow a, what we call the strategic shift by Iran. That it essentially, mm -hmm. that, you know, nuclear weapons were part of a broader strategy uh, for the Iranians. And only when that broader strategy changed could the nuclear calculus change. Um, I think the Obama administration took the opposite approach, and you heard this in President Obama's own words, that if you could somehow put the nuclear issue aside, sort of resolve it, you know, uh, shelve it in a way, that would open up space for resolving some of those other issues or talking about those other issues. And, and essentially, we thought that was backwards in the Bush administration. And I think that as you, you, you know, in a sense, you have more evidence now to look at, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because we had a nuclear deal. In my view, the Iranian, say, regional activities didn't actually change, maybe got worse in, say, that first year of implementation of the JCPOA. And now you can look at what's happening between Iran and some of the Gulf states. And you could say, is this really a strategic shift by the Iranians? And I think the evidence suggests, no, not really. This isn't a strategic shift. These are kind of tactical moves, maybe on both sides, but without, as, as Dennis noted, actual fundamental change. The, the missiles are still flowing and so on and so forth. So... So we haven't seen that strategic shift, even though we've seen these kinds of ups and downs in the nuclear program. And I do think it's a really relevant question for anyone looking to make Iran policy now or in the future, which is, can you really do this sort of standalone nuclear deal? And I will, I will say, just, you know, it is nice to hear some folks, you know, acknowledge that Iran is an actual player in this. I feel, <laughs> no, really, I feel like a lot of like discussions in Washington, you know, on either side, really, but, you know, they act like the Iranians don't get a say um, in the negotiations and the talks in their actions. And it's kind of nice to actually hear this acknowledgement because I, to me, that's always been the reality is like, oh, let's not forget they actually have, have, a, <laughs> they, they can actually affect things. Well, they, they are creating facts. They, they are that's, <laughs> that's a reality. And, and those facts, as I said, are creating, in my mind, an increasingly fraught situation. Definitely. Um, so round two, <laughs> Mike, um, the Bush team saw change in Iran's behavior as something that the Iranian people had mm. to bring about. But the regime recently crushed widespread protests aimed at this. Revolutions are hard to predict. But do you think that the Iranian people still have the power to change their regime or its behavior? You know, I, I tend to think that actually the Iranian people are the only ones with that power. Um, I, I don't think that sort of lasting positive change can be imposed from the outside. Hopefully that's a lesson we have learned over, you know, decades of U.S. foreign policy. I think change will have to come, real change will have to come from within in Iran. And I think actually this is probably one of the remaining points of bipartisan agreement on Iran, both that um, that change will have to come from within, that we would like to see it happen. And that we would like to try to support it when we when we see those sparks, although we're not always sure how to do that. There isn't necessarily consensus on that. And I think that if you look at modern Iranian history, you can say that, well, you know, I mean, we have seen in the 20th century, for example, at least three separate um, movements that resulted in significant change in Iran. We had the constitutional movement in the early 20th century, the first uh, decade of the 20th century. We then had Mohammad Mossadegh in the 1950s. And then, of course, we had the Islamic Revolution uh, in 1979. And so there is a pattern there where you have different factions or segments of Iranian society coming together, basically around the shared idea that they were fed up with the regime that was in power um, and casting aside that regime. Unfortunately, what followed was not always um, tidy and it wasn't always lasting. Um, but but we see that that has been the pattern. I see no reason to think that this won't recur again in Iranian history. I, I just think as a policymaker that the 
challenging fact is you never know when it's going to happen. You never know how. And of course, you never know what the result will be at the end of it. And so it's a difficult sort of hope to make policy around. And so you have to essentially do what you can to support the Iranian people uh, in the long run, while also taking whatever sort of short range actions you have to to say stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons, address its regional activities, and so forth. It's just that dictatorial regimes also are aware of this history, and they seem to be learning from them, and they seem to be teaching one another ways to prevent their own falls more and more. I mean, this is the thing is maybe years ago, it was more likely that a revolution could cause a change, but now some of these regimes think, oh, well, if we just follow A, B, and C, we can assure that this is not gonna happen at least for another <laughs> decade. I mean, look, at you're talking to an Iranian who, who fled the country when I was a child and been waiting you know, mm. decades and can't go back and would really like to know when. So when can I go back? My <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, you know, in a sense, uh, you might be asking the wrong person because I'm not an expert in democratic movements. But I will say this. Look, I, I believe what you're saying is right, that these authoritarian regimes, we see them not just learning from one another, but actively helping one another with surveillance of their populations, censorship, repression and so forth. But it sure still seems like these regimes are worried about their people. It's not like they don't they don't seem very comfortable um, in Iran uh, or in other authoritarian uh, states um, that they have somehow figured this out. I, I think that these regimes are inherently brittle. And I think that democracies where you sort of are you know, ruling based upon the will of the people and the sovereignty of the people are inherently much more stable. And so, while yes, it may be that authoritarian regimes have new tools and have new learning, um, which that, which they're using to repress their people and to try to forestall revolutions or uprisings or, or even just change, I don't think that the, that will work over the long run. I think we just don't know how long these regimes will last. Okay. So I won't buy a ticket just yet. <laughs> Elliot. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> the Iranian diaspora tried to create a coalition recently. Leading members of it tried to put together a, a coalition, um, came up with a charter and everything, but it basically largely fell apart within a couple of months. And there's a lot of intense infighting within the diaspora overall. Um, if you were advising some of these diaspora activists on what they can and should do to support the people of Iran, what would you tell them? First, the, the pattern you're describing is completely unsurprising. Um, I mean, we certainly saw it in Venezuela, <clears throat> but we have seen it really in every um, exile community. It's natural. You want to be the leader. I want to be the leader. Uh, there are parties that want to be the leading party. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was predictable. Um, <clears throat> what would I advise them? First of all, keep trying. That is, you may not be able to have a united front, a single united front, and you know that woman is the spokesman for all Iranians, but you can cooperate. And the more cooperation, the better. The more you can... <clears throat> appeal to uh, populations in the region, in Western democracies, in the U.S., the better. Um, I think also you should be looking for ways to communicate and help the Iranian people inside the country communicate. Now, uh, there are, for example, uh, TV and radio stations that come from exiles in California that at times have had a lot of uh, viewership in Iran. In London, too. Yeah, yeah in London, yeah. you've got, now, you've got Iran International, which was in London, it's now in the U, soon in the U.S. Uh, one of the things I think that exile should do is try very hard to get governments to improve the quality of their broadcasting. It's something that I think it's fair to say the um, American Iranian exile community hasn't really focused on. And our broadcasting is not very good. I've, you know, been, I mean, for decades, uh, from the Reagan administration on, been hearing, you know, compared to the British or the Israelis or whoever, um, VOA, for example, is not good. Now we have Farda, but um, I would urge them to be talking to governments uh, because you're pushing an extent to an extent on an open door. If governments are doing this. BBC or, or uh, Deutsche Welle, but they want it to work. They want it to be better. 
So you'd think maybe they would listen. And I put more emphasis on that. Interesting. Either one of you want to weigh in on that? The diaspora element? No, I think that point is is very well taken. Uh, it's not a surprise that there is this kind of dissonance and competition within these diaspora communities. Uh, and I don't think, I think Elliot's quite right. There has not been a kind of coherent set of messaging from here. And it could make a difference at a time when you have a public that's much more alienated in Iran than we've seen before. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, Dennis? Yeah. I am told that at some point, Iran's supreme leader, yeah. Ali Khamenei, is going to die. I'm really? I'm told this is a possibility. Uh -huh. How should the U.S. and its partners approach that inevitable and potentially vulnerable moments? Uh, it's a very interesting question from a lot of different standpoints. I want to pick up on one thing that, that Mike said a little earlier. If the U.S. looks like it's trying to intervene in that process, that's probably the most certain way to guarantee the opposite result will take place. We cannot... He's not going to live forever. No, he's going to... Look, I accept the fact that he's going <laughs> to die. But the question is, what is the U.S. should you asked me the question, what should we be doing at that time of vulnerability? And I want to explain in a second why I think it is there is an interesting moment at that juncture. But I think what I want to suggest is we have to be very careful about not looking like we're actively trying to affect who is going to replace him. That is not going to be a prescription for producing an outcome that ends up being what we want. Uh, the end of the day, any kind of that kind of external intervention is will coalesce a kind of nationalist response, almost certainly. Now, having said that, this is a time, I think, of great vulnerability for this kind of regime. It's not just because the, the public is deeply alienated, and it's not just because the ideology has long since lost any credibility. I'm very much reminded of the way the Soviet Union looked in the early 1980s, where nobody any longer believed in the ideology except those who were in power because of it. Uh, and it created below the surface in the elite itself, real changes. I have no doubt we're gonna see the same, we may already be seeing some of this happening within Iran. So this is gonna be a moment where the potential for change within Iran may be greater than we think. You know, I don't believe the, even though the Revolutionary Guard obviously was created as kind of the, the safeguard of the, of the regime, you know, it's it's not at all clear that the that within the Revolutionary Guard itself, there's a homogeneous attitude in terms of the ideology and the role of ideology and the like. So my sense is we may well see real competition uh, within the elite in a different way than we've seen up until now. What made change within the Soviet Union possible is that there was real frustration within the party apparatus, the most important of all the institutions. So I think that the, again, at a time when those competing or looking to see what Iran needs to do, they're going to be, they're quite aware of how deeply alienated the public is. There may be some who feel this is a time for us to ease conditions on the public. But we certainly have seen that again in authoritarian regimes when there's a succession crisis or a succession uh, process. So I think we want to be watching it very carefully. We want to think about are there subtle ways that we can play a role? Uh, and we should be talking to others. I mean, some of our allies who also pay real close attention and some, I would say, maybe even have a better grasp of what's going on. And we should be coordinating, okay, what should the posture be? There's a public posture that we should coordinate on, but there's also obviously more covert means that we could be involved, uh, we should be involved with and, and engaged with. Anyway, my the real point here is, I think the that for you, in terms of being able to buy a ticket, <laughs> you know, no one can no one can predict exactly when that will be. But I can say the first time when I think this regime will be much more shaken than it has been will be during succession, because that's going to become a point where there's much more competition within the elite, at least among the elite that matters. What are some of these subtle and covert ways? Well, some of the subtle <laughs> and covert ways. If, no, I mean, really, you guys like, you no, know, if you begin to talk about them, you kind of. <laughs> well, it you know, makes it harder to do it. But pick up on one thing Dennis said. That is a question of the allies. President uh, Bush used to do something very interesting when you know when when Angela Merkel would say, you know, what can I do to help? He would say, send me your ambassador. I don't have an ambassador in Tehran. You do. When he comes out for consultations or summer vacation, mm 
send him or her to Washington. And, you know, I attended those meetings with the British, with the Australian, with, um, and it was really fascinating because they're living there. <clears throat> That's particularly, let's say, a period of illness or, or death for the uh, Supreme Leader is an important time, I think, for us to reach out to friends who have embassies on the ground. What do you know? What are you hearing? Because we're not there. I mean, the point is there, they may be coming in and saying, if we were to take, if we, if we were to be uh, sending the certain kinds of public messages and privately, uh, there are ways to convey support. To those. I, mean, I, I think the messaging point is, is pretty important because I think actually whether it's around succession or not, I think it's very important that the U.S. government, you know, as we do in other situations, like when we think about China, that we distinguish between the regime and the people. And we make clear that this is not a sort of, you know, realist. We don't view this as a realist style competition where regime type doesn't matter. But in fact, there is a path, you know, where, um, you know, if if Iran takes certain steps, there's a very different kind of future for U.S.-Iran relations. Um, I mean, this is the kind of scenario where you could see a strategic shift, where you could have, you know, different leadership that wants a different um, sort of path and a different sort of foreign policy uh, for the country. doesn't mean anything will be easy, but I think you at least have to be clear in the message that that's an option, that that door is open. Can I just, I just want to uh, yeah. build on that. Yeah. I can see a kind of competition, not between those who say, gee, we want to, we want to give up the Islamic Republic versus those who don't. It's not going to be that, but it'll be between those who think, you know, confrontation with the rest of the world right now is actually not in our interest. It's going to deepen the problems on the inside. It's not going to make them easier. Versus those who say the only way we can maintain strict internal control is if we have confrontation that justifies these strict internal controls. So we actually have a stake uh, in how that competition plays out. But also, apropos of what Mike was saying, when certain kinds of public messaging may also be able to influence who ends up emerging. Uh, and I think it's fair to say we prefer to have a leadership that decides that confrontation with everybody else is not such a great thing. Mm -hmm. I do run the risk if I could just sure. jump in. <clears throat> Suppose that uh, Trump policy that I mentioned had worked in the sense that the Iranian regime had said, okay, let's negotiate. Well, let's talk about Yemen. Let's talk about um, uh, Iraq, let's talk about Syria, let's talk about nukes. The one thing that this government obviously would, in, in Tehran would not want to talk about is the internal situation. So one could then say, well, are we actually going to do that deal, which abandons the people of Iran mm. and the internal question? That issue could arise again. If a group came forward, or let's say won the battle, it said, we shouldn't be in an adverse situation with everybody. Um, but no change internally. I mean, after all, this is a succession period. Yeah. We're yeah. going to double down on internal repression. It creates a real moral issue for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember under the Trump years, they, they put out the 12 conditions. Yeah. And there was nothing about internal domestic human rights in any of those conditions in terms of what the U.S. government wanted Iran's government to do. It was all about external yeah. factors. And that a, was a real, that was a real statement of priority. Another thing here that has to be factored in, and, uh, and we should not fail to mention it, hostage taking. Yeah. Because whatever yeah. negotiations we engage in <clears throat> with the Iranian regime and whenever, I mean, one of the striking things about the, uh, the years of negotiation with John Kerry, he didn't get people out. He said he would. He said he had a deal to get Namazi out. And Namazi is still there. Mm -hmm. So I, I would hope that if we get to this point, including in a succession period, that's got to be at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Stop imprisoning Americans. But they, but they did. I mean, just to be clear, the, the Obama administration under Kerry got several Americans out. It was part of the prisoner swap. Right. So, so but the, some were left. That's, right. And, and yeah. so did the Trump administration get several sure. people out. Sure. What has not happened is the international, I hate the term international community. Um, <laughs> what That's a it, great quote. What, what democracies <laughs> have. I hate the term international community, said no, Elliot Abrams. You know, there is no international community. There isn't really. But what the Western democracies have, whose citizens are being taken prison. Yeah. After all, they're not taking Chinese prisoners. They're not taking Russian hostages. The countries whose citizens are being taken hostage have not managed 
somehow by pressure, by banding together to get the Iranians to stop doing that. And in a negotiation, that's got to be near the top of the list. It's a very good point. Elliot, given how partisan every issue has become in the United States, is it possible for any U.S. administration to engage in any meaningful negotiation with Iran? Sometimes I get the sense that some members of Congress don't like the idea of ever talking to Iran, the regime in any way. Like they don't want any conversation because they say this is a regime you absolutely cannot trust under any circumstances. There's just no point in talking to that. Um, so, you know, and in that same spirit, like, is is it possible for a treaty then, mm. a, a nuclear treaty, which the Tr Trump administration promised any deal they struck with, with, with yeah. Iran would be yeah. a treaty. Could that ever get through the Senate? Uh, I think your point is basically right. Everything is now <clears throat> super partisan. I mean, a treaty could get through the Senate <clears throat> if the president, whoever it is, if the president's party had a big majority in the Senate and needed didn't need to pick up opposition members or um, only needed to pick up you know, a couple. Uh, other than that, though, uh, you know, it's very hard to see. I, I'd add one more condition you're more likely to get this in the aftermath of a clear election victory and when the next election seems far away. Otherwise, this is, you know, it's going to become totally politicized. And uh, Iran policy certainly, well, has been for a very long time. I can't even remember back to when it wasn't. Certainly in the Obama years, it was very um, partisan. Democrats supported the agreement with very few exceptions. Republicans opposed it. And we're still there. Yeah. I mean, I actually think it's gotten worse. Like, again, like I'm saying, it's, it's as if you can't, even the idea of having like indirect talks is enough to like get blowback from some corners. And you just think, well, how else are we supposed to? I mean, Mike, Mike you, you've lived through a lot of this. I mean, is <laughs> well, it I guess what I would say though is, we all obviously focus on our little patch of, of foreign policy, but I think actually, uh, and I wrote an article about this, you can actually generalize this issue where if you look across yeah. these different relationships the United States has with small adversaries, essentially, that um, I'm not sure diplomacy has been very successful with any of them. And yet, if you look at sort of big peer adversaries, it's quite different. There is a sense it's with yeah. the Soviet Union, with yeah. China and so forth that we have to do diplomacy because, you know, there is this sort of, you know, pure relationship. Whereas um, with smaller adversaries, it's much more fraught because I mm -hmm. think on the part of the big state, there is a sense that actually we have all these coercive tools um, that we believe should work. Uh, on the sense, on the part of the small state, there's probably a lot more existential angst uh, in dealing with a big power like the United States than there would be for, for a big power. And so I, I would just caution to say, mm -hmm. I, I do think it's quite difficult to um, to use diplomacy in the U.S. Iran case, and I'm not sure that it is possible to get a sustainable deal. But I'm not sure that's just about the U.S. and Iran as it's often kind of portrayed. Yeah. I think that's. I, I mean, I, I think a good example is probably like Marco Rubio in Cuba. You know, I mean, like there's just like he's absolutely well, opposed and anything. But Chairman but then, Menendez, but, to be fair, so, so, that's so true. That's so true. But yeah. then you know, but they say they give the kind of the same reasoning, and and you're like, well. China's the same thing. Are you? Do you want to? But it's know, not. And, it's and, not. But this is what he's saying: is it's not the same because one is small and and there's perhaps more emotional attachment. But like there's, you know. But there's a, another reason too, <clears throat> from certainly from the Republican point of view, looking at the Obama record, and it's the same people again on Cuba. Of course, we don't want negotiation because you're going to negotiate everything away, just as you did under President Obama. Uh, in the case of Iran, you know. For those of us who oppose the JCPOA, of course, we don't want negotiations to restore the JCPOA. The worst thing that can happen is you'll succeed. <laughs> yeah, so you know, why would we want that? So, Mike, um, you're writing the Iran transition memo for the next administration. What is the one thing you would put in there that, that, that you would put in there if you knew you would under no circumstances get into any trouble? I, I would write, please give me a different assignment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, it's a very tough question to answer because I think that there is a real question as to in January 2025, what will we really be facing on this portfolio? I, I think that 
I'm sorry to say, we could very well be facing an Iran which has crossed the threshold and has either nuclear weapons or has, you know, produced the fuel for nuclear weapons and has hidden it away, essentially, and it's beyond our, our grasp. That is a very different scenario than an Iran which is still essentially where it is now, you know, sort of at 85% enrichment and, you know, uh, 12 days away from being able to have a bomb's worth of weapons grade uranium. Um, you know, so I, I think that the next administration is going to face a very difficult situation no matter what, but there are different flavors or varieties of extremely difficult situations that they could face, which is, you know, why I would say actually what's most important is what happens right now. And in a sense, the, the advice I would give if we are then where we are now is that more than anything, we need to strengthen our military deterrence uh, of Iran B because it goes back to what Elliot said at the beginning. If Iran is really determined to get a nuclear weapon and is willing to bear the economic cost of doing so via sanctions, and I think the Iranian regime has shown that they are willing to absorb enormous costs uh, against the interests of their own people for the sake of their nuclear program. And if this were really just, I mean, it does raise a question as an aside, if we're really just negotiating leverage, that's a big price to pay for just negotiating leverage, which is why I'm so skeptical that that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think you have to make the, the case to the regime that not only will you pay an enormous price, but in fact, we won't let you cross that line. And that's going to require more military deterrence. And I think given where we are now and given our other priorities in the world, that's very difficult to do. I don't pretend that that's an easy choice for any administration, but that really will be the advice I think the incoming president gets if we are then where we are now. If Iran has crossed that threshold, I don't know what that memo says, frankly. That will be a very difficult situation to contend with. And I, and I think the focus has to be on not getting there. But okay, can you remember this is a classified memo you're going to be writing <laughs> and you're not going to get in trouble. So when you say military deterrence, like what can you can you give a like a specific example of what that would mean? Like, should we like, you know, happen to drop off a mother of all bombs somewhere, you know, near yes, the Iranian yeah. border? I, mean, I just don't know. No, like, I, I can't. What does that mean? Military I'm, deterrence. I'm an, I'm a normal, ordinary person. Tell me what it means. So I think that we have two problems, right? There, there are essentially when we think about the possibility of uh, a military attack on Iran, we tend to talk about two actors, right? We talk about Israel and the United States. And I think it's fair to say that for anyone sitting in Tehran, there's a view that Israel has the will, but not the capability. The United States has the capability, but not the will. And so you have to rectify those two situations if you want to create deterrence. And so part of the answer, I think, is working with Israel, giving Israel the capabilities that they would need uh, to defend themselves. Number two would be changing the Iranian perception of the American will. And I think that's actually the much harder part because we have lived with one another the U.S. and the Iranian regime now for many decades, and there are set patterns of behavior. And so in a way, you have to break out of those patterns. We've had something like, excuse me, we've had something like 70 or 80 Iranian or Iranian-backed attacks mm. on American interests, for example, in Syria and Iraq. And 80, like three, 83. 83, thank wow. you. Yes. And something like three U.S. responses. Yeah. That's a pattern. And I think you would have to break out of that pattern by being willing to respond more often and more seriously uh, to those attacks. Now, the, the response that you'll get, of course, if you raise this in the interagency process is, look, we don't want to get sucked back into the Middle East. Yeah. What I would so, say in response to that is this is actually how you avoid getting sucked back into the Middle East, is you have to show uh, some toughness so that the Iranians don't get the nuclear weapon, because that's the best way of ensuring that we are not going to Can, can I just follow up yes, on this? I was going to ask you, because <laughs> right. I have many thoughts, but my thoughts are irrelevant. Hey, look, it's, what, what Mike is saying is, if you don't want to get sucked in, if you don't want to face a, a more limited set of options that will cost you much more, you have to do more now. The whole idea that we don't want to be distracted, wait, you will be much more distracted <laughs> later on if you don't do more. So I will, I'll pick up, I'll give you two examples of what could be done to fit Mike's uh, issue of capability on the one hand and will on the other. The Israelis have no forward basing. They're going to have, they're going to, have to hit targets repeatedly given the hardening of them. They have they have procured from Boeing four KC-46s to significantly improve their aerial, aerial refueling. The first one is not available to them because there's a queue until the end of 2025. Now, we can change that queue. Mm. You put them number one on the list, that sends a message. First, it says to the Iranians, gee, the Americans might actually not stop the Israelis. Right now, they think we will. And to change the issue of the perception of us, 
you know, why can't we take a page from the Israeli playbook? The Israelis carried out all sorts of attacks and never admit it. You know, so these 83 attacks, these are on our forces by Iranian proxies. The Iranians will always fight to the last of the Iranian proxies. They really could care less. You know, if we were in the middle of the night to hit one of the training sites, training camps for these groups in Iran without admitting it, you don't force the Iranians to do anything by admitting it. They get the message. You know, you have to do something that's out of character. That's really the essence of what Mike is saying. If we continue to do what's in character, they will continue to believe they run no risk. Our biggest problem right now, they have no fear. The idea, I'll tell you, early in the Obama administration, we were debating what would we do if they if they cross the 20 percent enrichment threshold. <laughs> we were debating that. And even to the point of saying we might have to do something militarily. They have 16 cascades of IR6s enriching to 60 percent. So their attitude is they've crossed all these different thresholds and nothing really has happened to them. So they've lost their fear. You don't have deterrence without fear. So actually, that. You're you're interesting. You make a good point about doing something that's out of character. The the killing, the U.S. killing of Qasem Soleimani. Um, it was sort of, I mean, I, I don't know if it's fair to say it was out of character, but it was like a mm -hmm. it was a big escalation mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were like, "Whoa, <laughs> they yeah. they did that. Yeah. They just did that." <clears throat> it's under Trump. And my question is, what do you guys think that that had the the effects of that overall good overall bad like because they're not stopping the program and yet it seemed like a really big punch but when iran attacked abtig the main petroleum site in saudi arabia the trump administration did literally nothing so what is i mean the lesson to iran is the americans are unpredictable it is not the lesson that i think mike's talking about which is the americans are getting tougher uh, you you can't have this on-off, unpredictable pattern. You need to have a pattern which suggests a change in behavior. If it's part of a pattern, if suddenly we provide the KC-46s or we move the Israelis up in the queue and you take a step like this and you're doing exercises and, and you also change how you talk about the issue, then you're sending a message that is, oh, something has now changed. Something is now different. If we don't create the, their perception that something is different, they're going to continue on the path they're on. I mean, I think that, you know, as we're doing this process of looking at the transition memos and looking back and trying to draw lessons, I will say that I think one of the lessons is we have to use all of our tools in concert, right? And a lot of us say that a lot. Dennis says it a lot. I know Elliot has written it, but it really is true. I mean, one of the problems we've had is that we have swung between saying, we're going to use this tool in this administration. Mm. Okay, now forget that tool. Now we're going to use this tool in this administration. And really, I think where hopefully we can all come to agree is that we have to use all those tools simultaneously. There has to be um, a, a sort of a subtlety to the way we approach these issues. But I think that you also have to look at lessons learned from other arenas, right? And I think you've seen this happen in real time with the Ukraine conflict, where initially the Biden administration's instinct was to offer reassurance, essentially, you know, to the Russians about we're going to limit this conflict, but we're not going to do this. We're not going to do that and so forth. And it was having the opposite of the intended effect because it was emboldening the Russians. That obviously is an arena of tremendous peril because you're facing a nuclear armed state. I feel like we haven't really sort of applied that lesson to other theaters or arenas. So, um, I mean, in, in this case, where we're facing a very different kind of adversary, we're not taking the same sort of approach. And so this issue of learning across issues, uh, much less across time, I think is one of the, the challenging things we face. Um, so I want to jump to an audience question. I, I am going to ask you your last question, but I'm kind of saving it. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think the, some of the questions are, one of them that I've heard from people is, is this question of whether the U.S. is abandoning the Middle East at all. Mm. Uh, I can say, you know, when I, when I talk to Arab officials privately, they do raise this question. Mm. Are you leaving us? When I talk to U.S. officials privately, um, but then sometimes publicly, they just completely deny that. So the question then is, in terms of the U.S. role in the Middle East going forward in general, is it going to be one where we are 
walking away? Can we walk away? Should we walk away? What's your prediction? All three of you, please. Let's start with Dennis. All right. Um, I will tell you a brief story. So way back when, when uh, Jim Baker was about to become Secretary of State, and he, and he said to me in what could only become famous last words, he said, I'm not going to fly around the Middle East the way George Schultz did. <laughs> <laughs> He said, you know, the Middle East is basically where secretaries of states go to to lose their credibility. I'm not doing it. Of course, he ended up playing a, a major role. Now, at the time, I said to him, look, it's fine for you to say you're going to ignore the Middle East. The problem is it won't ignore you. Uh, and if you're always reacting, your choices are going to be much more constrained. You want them reacting to you rather than the other way around. The Middle East will continue to affect us whether we like it or not. You know, energy is not going to disappear as a factor, at least at least uh, fossil fuels for at least 25 to 30 years. That will affect the economy. Terrorism is not going to disappear as a reality. Uh, the the sense that we don't want a hostile power to to <clears throat> dominate the region because it will threaten us. That's not going to go away. So we have an interest in being there. Now, the administration, for understandable reasons, has other priorities to do. You have to invest enough in managing this region if you don't want it to be constantly confronting you with a set of challenges that inevitably will suck you in and will cost you more so my my short answer to your question is we can't we can't give up having a coherent strategy for the region so it's a kind of about like raising the floor of engagement do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i mean the reason i bring this up is because i feel like one of the the things about the Biden administration is they're constantly talking about the need to focus on China, mm -hmm, right? Right. And in my experience, my reporting, everything, the Chinese view this entire globe as the arena of competition. <laughs> and yet we seem to think, oh, <laughs> it's like Asia. You know, it's like, yeah. no, yeah. like they're competing in the Middle East, they're competing in Latin America. We're not, we're barely even in Latin America. Yeah. Don't even get me started on Africa. Um, <laughs> so, so when you when you're talking about what you're talking about and maybe others can weigh in and on the broader question is just is it about raising the minimum level of engagement we have everywhere around the world in order to both make people feel reassured that we're not abandoning them and at the same time deal with this this geopolitical long term threat that is China. Let me say I, I don't see that. What do you mean we're abandoning Middle East? We have bases. Uh, Kuwait, Qatar, Emirates, Bahrain. We CENTCOM has about 35,000 people in the Middle East. We have people on the ground still, soldiers on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Um, you know, uh, we got something like 7,500 troops in Kuwait. We could probably get away with 6,000 or 5,000. Yeah. It's not such a big deal. That's not withdrawing from the Middle East. I, I think the, the the broader question you're raising is, well, what are what's our Latin American policy? I don't think we have a Latin American policy. Uh, I don't think we are really competing with China there, but that's in a sense, a subset of the broader question. What are, what are we doing? What are we trying to do? So to me, this is a broader critique um, of the administration, which knew that it didn't wanna do what Donald Trump did, but on the positive side has not really been able to articulate what it does wanna do. Mike, what are you yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a, a pretty complex issue in a sense, because if you think back to... That's not an acceptable answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll elaborate. If you think back but to the that 90s, will be in the memo. <laughs> complex issue, okay? If you think back to the 90s or the 80s even, um, um, or the, you know, the, the 70s. I mean, these guys were both working on policy then. Um, I'm just, <laughs> Stone Age. I meant, I meant as a dig, but maybe it wasn't. But um, <laughs> as, 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 as an elementary school kid, yes. Um, we were perceived, I think, as having a commitment to the Middle East without the presence <clears throat> that we have now. And so it was a, it was sort of high commitment, low presence. And now we're, we find ourselves in this situation where we have actually still quite a heavy presence, but we're perceived to have a low commitment. You ask, mm. why is that? I think American officials would like to get back to the sort of status quo ante where we could maybe have a different presence in the region, but still be perceived as committed. I tend to think that as we go forward and focus on, you know, so-called great power competition, I think the Middle East will become more important, not less important, actually. I mean, and all you have to do is look at a basic history of the world to understand that the Middle East has always been, for better or worse, frankly, a theater of competition between external powers. Um, and if you look at the way the war in Ukraine has unfolded, 
what what finally got President Biden to, you know, I think begrudgingly go to Saudi Arabia was in part a war in Europe. Yeah. Right. And and that, I think, should tell us something about the role that this region is going to play going forward. I do think that. So I don't think our focus on the Middle East will change. And I think this whole idea of focusing on this region or that is, mm -hmm. is foolish because these are all, these are, in a sense, sort of arbitrary boundaries we place on regions. Yeah. Um, and it's they don't really have any meaning in the real world. I think the agenda will have to change, and I think our approach will have to change. I, I think that what our partners perceive is that we're essentially sort of acting as though we're pursuing the same policy we have for the last few decades, where we're doing with less enthusiasm and fewer resources, which doesn't come across well. Um, I think what we need to do actually is to turn the page. We need a new agenda. We need to prioritize more in the region. And that's difficult to do because we have this legacy of a policy of the past 20 or 30 years, which was pursued actually by multiple administrations, Republican and Democratic. And that now needs to be updated. I do think, though, it's important to note here, and it goes back to what you were saying about the Iranians, Hallie, is that our partners have agency in this as well. And they're changing as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that despite all the sort of, you know, talk about the U.S. abandoning them, whether they really want to put all their eggs in the American basket now. We see them diversifying. Yeah their relationships, hedging their bets, also trying to gain advantage by sort of, you know, aligning both with the Chinese and with the Playing West. Playing people so, off of right. each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so that you're, actually, you're saying what I was going to say, which is basically that, you know, they have their interests as well in yes. complaining. We, about, by the way, we've seen this before. Yeah. And we the have so-called non-align movement, you know, basically yeah. NASA yeah. thought he could play both sides off against each other and see what he would gain. We're in an era where there's hedging of bets because not only are there some doubts about us, but they also see some advantage to be gained. Well, but people, people my age, I would say, I mean, we came came of age in policy when there was just one superpower in the world. Right. Yeah. A very different kind of diplomacy right. and different kind of strategy. Yep. Right. And in a sense, I feel as though we have to relearn things that have been forgotten from previous episodes of great power competition, how to cope with this, you know, sort of hedging and this competition uh, amongst external powers. Which I think kind of leads nicely into my final question for Dennis. Um, is foreign policy really just the art of buying time? Because that's what it feels like on Iran. Uh, foreign policy is not just the art of buying time, but a lot depends upon what is the nature of the threat. If you decide that you don't have great options, then you're looking for ways to try to limit the damage of what you're facing. If you don't have, in the case of Iran, my argument is buying time is actually a risky strategy it makes it you it makes it much more likely you're going to face a war this is the last thing we want to face and what we should be doing is we should be raising the cost of them because buying time is something that has served their interests look how look what they have done with the time that's hardly in america's interests and i think that's buying time may work on some issues but it doesn't work on this one well thank you guys so much thank you thanks Alec. thank I you think this was great and i really enjoyed it and uh, let's do it again sometime maybe next time we can talk about something really controversial <laughs> <laughs>